an historic moment as the U.S. moves its embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. And for many evangelical Christians, the event is more than just politics. The other news swirling around the embassy's move to Jerusalem is what it could signal as part of biblical prophecy. For many evangelicals, it's one of the steps to the second coming of Jesus. Last year, we saw the rise of a mysterious polio-like illness affecting children around the country. And the work of a Chinese scientist led to ethical questions about gene editing. Meanwhile, medical breakthroughs like 3D body part printing and health devices you can wear show the increasing power of technology in our health care. A California kindergarten teacher is facing outrage after discussing gender identity with her students. One child came to the teacher with books on the subject while going through a gender transition. Now the teacher is defending herself. Story we're learning tonight, assistant pastors will fill in for Bob Coy, who abruptly resigned as senior pastor at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. About 7,500 worshipers attending Sunday service were informed the 58-year-old had resigned on Thursday following a, quote, moral failing in his life. Violent shaking, debris falls from the ceiling, terrified people dive under desks. It's okay. Okay. This video from a TV reporter inside a sixth floor office of the Nesbitt Courthouse in downtown Anchorage shows the earthquake lasted several seconds. Inside this home, a horrified mother grabs her children. She heads toward the door, then hugs them. A passenger in this vehicle took this video of an off-ramp that collapsed, an SUV stuck in the middle of the damage. The earthquake, which measured 7.0, struck at about 8.30 a.m. local time and caused significant damage to homes, buildings, and other infrastructure across Anchorage. Widespread power outages are reported. In this security video, you can see what appear to be several transformers blowing up in the background. Jasmine, you're one of the youngest and first drag queen slash kids. And I've heard of you. We saw your parents in the piece that we did, and your parents are so supportive of you, but they, they've also, they've encouraged you to stay and be who you are. So how has that inspired you to be open about dressing in drag? They support me by letting me do what I want to do, by letting me do what I want to do. Today marks one year since one of Hawaii's largest and most destructive volcanic eruptions. Kilauea spewed billions of yards of lava in the months that followed. You think we'll see lava again? Without a doubt, Kilauea volcano will erupt again. We just don't know when or where. This past week, the already difficult relationship between the U.S. and Iran has become even more tense. Administration officials have warned that they would respond with, quote, unrelenting force to any Iranian attack. Tehran has threatened to exceed caps on its nuclear program. And today, Saudi Arabia says that rebels in Yemen, who are believed to be backed by Iran, staged a major attack. By next week, more than 50 Three Square Market employees will have bionic hands with a credit card chip implanted near their wrist. You just swipe your hand. Basically, it's a serial number that is assigned to your credit card. The company is offering the chips, which cost about $300 a piece, to its employees for free. The technology is already being used in Europe, but the company hoping to popularize the chips here in the U.S. is far from tech hubs like Silicon Valley. 20 years and 700 victims. That is just part of the shocking revelations contained in a joint investigation by the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express News into sexual abuse, assault, and cover-up within the Southern Baptist Church, the largest Protestant denomination in America. The report is called Abuse of Faith. While no man knows the day or the hour, Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash. The seven, how soon is the Lord returning? Jacob. Less things that Jesus, dear friends, you know, so often we're concerned with his coming, the signs of the close of the age, prophetic events in the world in which we live, and how these coincide with what Jesus, the apostles, and the Hebrew prophets told us to anticipate prior to the return of Christ. 
And we've approached this subject multiple times from multiple aspects. We have a teaching called the caveats or the warnings of the Oliver Discourse. And we begin by warning about rambunction. People who have a distorted view of the doctrine of imminency. They think the doctrine of imminency depends on the timing of the rapture. In fact, Jesus made it clear in the parable of the wealthy farmer with the two barns. He can come at any time, any moment, any instant for any one of us. We should live our lives accordingly because the Lord can come for any one of us individually, irrespective of when he comes for the church. The doctrine of imminency and our call to live moral lives is in no way dependent on the timing of the rapture. Although we firmly believe in the doctrine of the rapture, its timing is not important to imminency as some of the pre-trib proponents of the rapture mistakenly believe and teach. Secondly, we've warned about those who get caught up in this rambunction when they see seismic events uh, that are happening with volcanoes or earthquakes, or when they see natural disasters increasing or famines increasing. These things are indeed signs in the fact that they are increasing and becoming more frequent, but they are not the signs that his return is at the doorstep, simply that it's coming closer. We look also, obviously, at prophetic events in the Middle East. The prophet Isaiah made it clear that God would regather the Jews twice as a nation and a people to their homeland, once after the Babylonian captivity, and the second time has taken place in the present age in 1948, 1967, with the recapturing and reunification of Jerusalem, etc. All of these things point to the return of the Lord. Certainly environmental catastrophes, natural disasters becoming more frequently uh, apparent in the world in which we live. And not least of all, the events in Europe concerning Brexit, concerning trying to make the iron stick to the clay to hold the EU together by all means. We've also warned about the ecumenical and interfaith movements setting the stage for Antichrist and the emergence of Babylon the Great. All of these things and more, broadly speaking, are signs of the Lord's return, economic calamity that will come upon the earth, none of them knowing the way out, fear and anxiety among the nations. False Christs, false prophets, these cults, we can go on and on and on. Why is it becoming so acutely intense <clears throat> in the thinking of so many consecrated believers in their prayer life as they study God's word, that Jesus is indeed coming soon? Not just in the broad sense that we see prophecy being fulfilled, but that the actual timing of the rapture and resurrection may be closer than most of us think. Now, I do take the view that the rapture and the resurrection, the parousia, will not occur until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. Of this, I'm quite certain, and we have many teachings dedicated to it. However, prophecies can be fulfilled very quickly. We deal with this on our teaching called the vector, the vector. There were hundreds of prophecies about the first coming of Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, but most of those were fulfilled in a 35 year period. Most of those were fulfilled <clears throat> in a three and a half year period. And most of those were fulfilled in a six day period. The closer we get to his coming, the faster prophetic events happen. 1948 was important prophetically. 1967 was important prophetically. But now events that are important prophetically are becoming so frequent, it's difficult to keep tabulation on the exponential rate 
of which they're happening. I'm not an alarmist. I warn against rambunction. There are seven things, however, that keep ringing out, at least these seven. There may be more, but seven that impress me the most. There may be other things the Holy Spirit is impressing upon you. But I'd like to share these seven things with you. Things that make me think. One is the evolution of technology. Certainly, subcutaneous implantation technology of chips, already abounding in animals, now experimentally being used in human beings, very chips and things of this nature. But more than that, Google Translator, or these devices that will still soon, very soon, turn your cell phone into a translator. When you're in Tokyo or when you're in um, Shanghai and you ask in English, is there a restaurant that serves Western food? And the person hears it in Japanese or Chinese, answers in their cell phone or in yours, and it comes back translated. Mankind's capacity to think he can reverse the curse of the Tower of Babel with his technology. When God sets a limit, when God has set a division among the nations in response to man's sin, he cannot allow man to reverse it. He is sovereign. These technologies are becoming better, cheaper, and more easily available. They will soon be in cell phones. Now, God put this division among languages. He cannot allow man to undo it with the press of a button. This is not to say that technology is wrong or bad in itself, but it is to say, once more, as we've always pointed out, A, anything fallen man can use for evil, he will. Ultimately, no matter how much good the technology can be used for, it'll ultimately be used for evil, much the same as nuclear technology. Radioactive isotopes to treat cancer, weapons of mass destruction. One example we've cited so often. And B, when God sets a limit, God has set the limit. People cannot transverse that limit. This goes beyond this. Second is longevity. Remember, it is only the life expectancy in the third world being so low that is keeping average rates of longevity less than 80 years. God has set the limit once more because of sin at 80 years. Now, I first began warning of this around the year 2000. Now we are nearly 20 years further, and these technologies have taken off as I expected they would, but they're going to become household realities. Biomedical technology will so increase that human longevity is already going beyond 80 years in the developed world. And when it eventually catches up to the third world, the developing world, God has set a limit. He cannot allow it to continue. Technology and longevity, particularly in languages and in biomedical technology and pharmacology. <clears throat> Thirdly, the role and place of Iran. Every day we see Iran in the news. We can only understand Iran in light of the prophecies of Daniel chapter 10. When Israel is regathered as a nation, Satan will try to destroy it in multiple ways, but his most desperate weapon will be Iran. That is the prince of Persia, the principality, the demonic power over Persia that will bring it into conflict with Israel and with the West.
Fourth, the incredible pace at which homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgenderism have become socially mainstream and morally acceptable. This is frightening. Remember, we have a teaching called not even a minyan. Twice the New Testament uses the events of Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot and his family being rescued as a type, a foreshadowing of what will happen at the end of the age. The people of God will be surrounded by militant and aggressive homosexuality. There will be no more living at peace with it. What had begun as tolerance now sees the tolerance redefined as you must condone and accept, and we have the right to teach it to your children. You do not have the right to object, and if you do, you're a bigot and a homophobe. We will see and are already seeing churches, even evangelical churches, compromise with this. Men of Satan like Steve Chalk in Great Britain or Tony Campola in the United States. Once upon a time, evangelical spokesmen going with this agenda, compromising with it certainly, making inroads all over the place. Recently, the president of the largest supposedly evangelical Christian denomination in the United States, the Southern Baptist, has said that evangelical Baptists, born-again Christians, should be the strongest advocates for homosexual, lesbian, transgender rights. You will begin to treat them first and foremost like people who deserve compassion, not scorn or judgment or a political voting block that we need to marginalize. When you understand that, then what that means is that you become a person who will, for example, stand up and be among the fiercest advocates for the preservation of the dignity and the rights of LGBT people. Because we recognize that gay and lesbian people are essentially just like us, people made in the image of God like us and deserving of all the dignity and respect that we desire for us or our children. What rights are they denied? Is this the right to teach someone else's children that it's normal? the right to redefine gender, to use a grammatical definition of male and female instead of a biological one. There's X and Y chromosomes, but in languages, many languages, a male can be a female or something female can be male. El mapa instead of la mapa. In Greek, the same. Jesus is called the Petra, the rock and the feminine. Peter is called the stone and the masculine, Petros. In so many languages, including biblical languages, Hebrew, Greek, gender and sex are not the same. Male and female, as defined sexually and grammatically, are different. The grammatical definition of male and female has been imposed as if it is natural and normal, where we are supposed to ignore the biological realities. This is madness. It's not even logical. But to see Christians calling this rights and we should be the advocates for it? At best, you get the double-talking compromise of Carl Lynn of Hillsong on this issue. How many people are taking a stand? This is going to become more and more oppressive, aimed at our children and our grandchildren, because those who identify themselves as male and female based on a grammatical definition instead of a biological one cannot reproduce. They cannot have children, so they demand the right to adopt other peoples or to convert other peoples to their lifestyle. 
This is going to become something that places the true people of God under siege, and the Lord will have to act in judgment, but first of all, in rescue, as he did in the days of Lot. To have seen Rick Warren with Elton John, there's a film of Elton John and his homosexuality called Rocket Man. To have Rick Warren in front of the American Congress with Elton John holding up hands, smiling together, saying, if I kissed you, it would be the kiss heard around the world. And people look upon Rick Warren as a great evangelical leader. This is Genesis 18 and 19. This is what the New Testament said would happen in the last days. The Lord will rescue his people and judgment will come. But to see evangelicals compromising with it. Fifth, the big one, the apostasy in the church reaches worse heights every year. Began with the ecumenical movement. Then the word faith money preachers, the name it and claim it crowd, where a perversion of the gospel became a scam. Gospel was discredited. And it was only those who spoke out who were criticized and faulted within the church. Then the counterfeit revivals from Toronto and Pensacola, championed by deceivers like Michael Brown. Then, with Michael Brown and John Arnott having done the preparations, things moved to the new apostolic reformation and to Bethel, open Gnosticism coming into the church, pretending it's hermeneutics, mysticism, pretending it's spirituality. Preachers like Stephen Furtick, Narsa Jesus. It gets worse and worse and worse. Mainstream evangelical institutions like Liberty University, allowing someone like Stephen Furtick in. Charles Stanley, allowing his son Andy to teach open, open heresy concerning the Old Testament and the place of scripture, that our faith does not depend on it. John MacArthur is saying it's going to be possible to take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist and still be saved and go to heaven in open defiance, open rejection, apparently, of Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And so many people who certainly know better. Bill Johnson, J.D. Hall, Todd Friel, people who present themselves as conservative evangelicals going along passively with the most outrageous heresy concerning the coming Antichrist imaginable. This is apostasy, not within Christendom. We've always had Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, the cults, the World Council of Churches, liberal Protestantism. We've always had those on the road to Babylon. But now we see it in evangelical circles. Not just people like Tim Keller or people like Rick Warren. We're talking about those who used to be the pillars of theological conservatism. Something's gone wrong. I warned a number of years ago that what happened in Great Britain was going to happen in America unless there was a repentance. In Great Britain, once Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones went to be with the Lord, there were no more great expositors. There's one left of that tradition that goes back to Charles Spurgeon, Campbell Morgan, <clears throat> Martin Lloyd-Jones, <clears throat> an elderly brother named David Pawson. He's the last of the Mohegans. There's no more, there are no more British 
Bible expositors of that caliber. No more. There are no more British theologians of the caliber of F.F. F. Bruce, Howard Marshall, Dr. Gundry. They, they were the last of it. We have one left. And he's a professor of physics, and cosmology, Dr. John Lennox, but he's not a theologian. He's just a theolo theologically literate, scientific academic. It's over. There is no more leadership in the body of Christ in Great Britain. Once Martin Lloyd-Jones left, Campbell Morgan left, F.F. F. Bruce left, it disintegrated. I asked the question about 15 years ago in the United States, what is going to happen when we no longer have David Wilkerson, Dave Hunt, Chuck Smith? What's going to happen when those men have either retired due to reasons of health and age or gone to be with the Lord? What happens when there are no more Dave Hunts or Chuck Smiths or David Wilkerson's? Were these men perfect? No. Were they godly and did they teach the truth? Yes. But where's the next generation? It's not there. You've had hustlers and false teachers. We've had unbelievable public displays of, of, of lunacy. It's what Charles Spurgeon predicted over 100 years ago. A time will come when instead of having shepherds in the pulpit feeding the sheep, we will have clowns entertaining the goats. We've seen apologists People like Ravi Zacharias caving in, compromising. We've seen the Southern Baptists, the largest evangelical denomination, giving place to people like Beth Moore, the mystic who leads the Lectio Divina with John Piper. The apostasy. And it's getting worse, and it's getting worse past. That's the fifth. The sixth, Jerusalem. A partial sacrifice of an animal took place near the Temple Mount in the Southern Excavations area. The Temple Institute has already collected probably 98 or 99 percent of the instrumentation necessary to reinstitute Levitical worship in a temple. If you see a compromise <clears throat> on the Temple Mount allowing for the reconstruction of the Jewish temple, if the proposition of the late Dr. Asher Kalpin was followed, for instance, where well, you would not need to dismantle the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock, to rebuild it because the location would be placed 70 meters north of the Dome of the Rock as one possibility. Look out. In the Y River negotiations, the Clinton administration in the United States proposed this. They proposed a division of the Temple Mount itself in a projected peace plan that didn't happen. If it did happen, it would fit the prophecies of Revelation 11 like a glove. The outer courts are given to the Gentiles for a season until the times of the Gentiles are completed in accordance <clears throat> with the prophecies of Daniel. But with prefabrication, pre-construction, a fully operational Levitical temple can be standing on the Temple Mount in less than 18 months' time. 
in less than 18 months time. Now they have red heifers. Now they have crushed crustaceans from the area around Caesarina Maritina in the Eastern Mediterranean to make the exact dye of the exact color needed for the temple curtains. Things that were not possible 12, 15 years ago. Mitochondrial DNA testing on Jews with Levitical names like Levi, Levine, Cohen, Siegel. There are hundreds, hundreds found to have a genetic commonality from the broader family, obviously deriving from the tribe of Levi. There are two yeshivas, religious institutions, dedicated to the resurrection of a Levitical priesthood. Again, it can happen in 18 months' time. All of these things, the way technology is evolving, particularly man thinking he can reverse the Tower of Babel in its curse. Man thinking with biomedical technology and pharmacology, he can supersede the limit God placed on average human longevity. The place of Iran in threatening the existence of Israel. The growth of homosexuality in its militancy and how it is plaguing and threatening Christian children and families. The apostasy in the church and the moves to reconstruct the temple which can happen so quickly. Yes, there are other signs in Europe with Brexit, and the iron and the clay and in the economy, in the environment. I accept all of these things. But so far, these six things stand out the most to tell me that the Lord is not just coming soon. He may be coming sooner than we think. And there's one more. One more. I've pointed this out many times, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I'm obligated to point it out once again. In the charismatic movement's early days, before it went completely off the rails, and in the Jesus movement among the hippies, the last major revival in the Western world, there was a tremendous saturation of interest infused by the Spirit of God with the reality that Jesus is coming soon, that we've moved into a prophetic era because of what was happening in the Middle East, Europe, etc. The apostasy in the evangelical church had not reached anything like the degree it has now. Homosexuality and homosexual militancy did not reach anything like the degree it did now and was certainly not in the church. The Iranian revolution was yet to happen. The Shah was still in power. The microcompressor revolution and the microchip revolution was in its near infancy. There was talk of rebuilding the temple after 1967, but it was only talk. That's all. Not anymore. Now, we are more than a generation closer to the return of Jesus than we were in the late 1960s, early 1970s. More than a generation closer from the time of the Jesus movement, the time of the charismatic movement. It was at that time 
evangelicism began to explode in the third world, particularly Latin America. 40, 50 years closer. Yet now, there is far less interest in his coming, in his return, than there was a generation ago. Deceivers like Rick Warren, raised up by the devil, actually teaching Christians to avoid end time prophecy, calling it a diversion, which he arrives at by translocating verses and paraphrased uh, butcherings of scripture. Far less interest. His coming is getting closer and there's far less interest in it. Let us all be sober and take heed to what is written in God's word and to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is coming soon became a cliche, albeit a true one. Mar Anatta, Maranatha became a farewell greeting, albeit a true one. But there's one more. And it's not a cliche. The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. May the Lord give us the grace to be ready and the grace to fulfill the task of preparing the way for his return. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless you and thank you for listening. 